It's amazing to be here, really. There are so many brilliant scholars in this room, brilliant intellectuals and brilliant lawyers, all of whom are making a difference. And that is just heartwarming. It is deeply, deeply gratifying. We even have a very distinguished federal judge. And we hope that she will be ma making a difference as soon as we can get her back on the bench. Uh, everyone here, in some way or another, has transformed our understanding of administrative power. Administrative law, law in quotation marks, of course, is no longer in a little academic box. It was very comfortable there. It was, there was no intrusion from the outside. And as Joe and I were discussing just a little while ago, he points out in these agencies, it's really quite cozy when's dealing with one's colleagues who share the same mindset. And when the outside world, the court order intrudes, it's that a little pesky, bothersome thing that you brush off as quickly as you can and go ahead as, as you were beforehand. Fortunately, the administrative state has been taken out of its safe little space, its safe little box, and we now have public debate and questioning on this most central of questions. It's gratifying to think that my book may have had some small part in this, but I confess the primary reason for it, I don't think was my book, and I don't think was our litigation or the intellectual work of others in this room, important as that all is, don't let me dis discount it. I think we have to be actually grateful to others for that, namely uh, Presidents uh, Clinton and Obama. In their administrations, the administrative state sought to prove something that hadn't been understood beforehand. It was previously thought the administrative state was merely a burden on those corporations, and therefore was not really much trouble for us individuals. It therefore, didn't really bother us. Our civil rights didn't seem to be so affected. But we learned as the administrative state flexed its muscles at the beginning, in the, well, in the last 25 years or so, that it's not just about corporations. It bears down on each of us in all sorts of unpleasant ways. So you may not be interested in the administrative state, but it is interested in you. And that's why I think the, the NCLA is beginning to have real traction because there's a genuine issue out there, something that affects all of us, that is a matter of our civil liberties, not just a matter of the separation of powers. It bears down on us and hurts us in the thousands of ways. And so we need to have a civil rights movement and at the vanguard, the NCLA, and I have to express particular thanks, by the way, to Mark Chenoweth, who actually makes it run, and our lawyers who actually bring it home in the courts. Um, I'm just sitting by the, so by, uh, by the side and chuckling, thinking how much fun it is. Um, and so that leads me to a personal point. Uh, at a very personal level, this is gratifying, not just because it takes down uh, sort of what sort of benevolent tyranny, is, as Chokeville would describe it, although I don't think it's that benevolent, um, it's not just that the administrative state has been taken out of its little box, its little academic box. Frankly, it brought me out of my little academic box. Um, I used to be an historian. I studied the dead, and they were conveniently several <laughs> centuries away. Um, and you know, I talk to the dead. Um, I'm not schizophrenic, they don't talk back. Um, but I would talk to the dead, preferably in the 17th rather than just the 18th century, and it was all very jolly. Uh, but it, you know, it's nice occasionally to talk to the living. And so finally, I have a chance to talk to the living. And for that, I'm deeply grateful to all of you, and particularly to my colleagues at the NCLA. I now can talk about contemporary law with people who are alive and who talk back. Um, I just want to switch in gears a little bit. I just want to say a little bit about Jonathan Turley. He's going to get his own introduction in a minute. But he and I were colleagues here at GW for a long time. And he was a particularly formidable and amusing colleague. And so it's great to have him uh, at this, at this event um, and to talk about his new book, which by the way, I strongly recommend. Um, and I just want to acknowledge, he was way ahead of me on the question of administrative power. Um, I never really made much attention to executive power, but he's been talking about executive power and its dangers for a very, very long time. So congratulations, um, I have to admit, you are way ahead of me on that. Now, I do want to talk about some substance, if you'll forgive me. <clears throat> I want to talk about what I'll call the new wave of administrative power, or if you prefer, the cutting edge of the administrative state. Administrative law, again in quotation marks, is taught in law schools as an order orderly, rational, sanitary regime. Although not quite the rule of law, it's presented as at least, well, the rule of rules. 
But even if that vision of orderly rules once were true in some golden age, in other words, the 1930s, um, and of course I don't think it was a golden age, and certainly not the 1930s, um, I, can't, I must say it no longer captures the current reality. The cutting edge of the administrative state is now very, very different. It is a combination not of authorizing statutes and rules, but rather of what I'd call sub-administrative power and privatized power. So first, let's talk about sub-administrative power. This is part of a broader declension of law. The Constitution promised us the rule of law, in other words, regulation by act of Congress. That's what the Commerce Clause is all about. The 20th century administrative state substituted the rule of rules. This was classic administrative regulation typified by notice and comment agency rulemaking as if that were a substitute for elected representatives. That was the ideal, and to some extent, the administrative state lived up to it. But all along, agencies sometimes descended to less sanitary mechanisms, the sub-administrative mechanisms. What are they? Well, some have been sort of assimilated into the sanitary sphere, waivers, conditions on grants, things like that. But also, there were the more gutter-like forms, administrative extortion, you know, nice business you got there, we're gonna do some side inspections every day. You won't have time to do your work, so sorry. Uh, third party boycotts, right? Such as Operation Choke Point. Hints of retaliation. You wouldn't want us to revise our regulations, would you? Now come on, you do X, Y, and Z. And then of course there are even voluntary arrangements. Might we call them conspiracies to deprive people of their civil rights? Voluntary arrangements with companies to get their cooperation. For example, a coordination of censorship. The social media companies need to coordinate. Why? A, they like to sanitize their sites for branding purposes. B, they like to control what the public thinks. They have a view of themselves as the, you know, the public improvers. But to do this, they have to make sure that their users don't go to other sites to see the stuff that you removed from your own, right? But they, can they talk to each other about this? No, they can't, because that would be coordination in violation of the antitrust laws. But don't worry, the government will come along, the intelligence agencies and, and, and other departments will come along and offer coordination and tell the companies, sometimes working through private cutouts, again, to avoid some government action, the First Amendment, and tell them, well, this is topic of the day, this is what you're suppressing this week, and that way they get coordination. It's really a conspiracy to violate the antitrust laws, not to mention the First Amendment. All of these mechanisms, whether they're a form of uh, regulatory harassment and extortion, or the cooperation that facilitates the censorship, fall below the regular sort of administrative power. This isn't the rule of law, it isn't the rule of rules, it is sub-administrative. But in the 21st century, these sub-administrative mechanisms have become the cutting edge of the administrative state. It's the state-of-the-art means of accomplishing what otherwise would fail for being unauthorized or unconstitutional. And then there's the second element of the new wave of, constitution, of, of uh, administrative power. Accentuating the administrative power is a growing tendency to use it to secure privatization. Of course, I've already given an example or two of this. This could be done by law. We can have laws requiring privatization, but it can also be done with administrative rules and conditions. For example, Title IX, it's a condition, but it gets universities to act on behalf of the government in regulating us. And then there's the regulation of human subjects research, led by HHS, it uses conditions essentially to um, impose licensing of research and publication on academics. But the privatization is especially effective through sub-administrative mechanisms. And the examples, I've mentioned some of them before, but I want to run through some just to make it clear. Operation Choke Point is about pressuring banks to cut off services to payday lenders. There's the Vulo case currently in the Supreme Court in which little hints about, hey, working with the NRA might be some sort of you know, reputational risk. You sure you want to do that? You say this to banks and insurers, they get skittish and they run away because they know what that means. Um, and then there's censorship through social media platforms, which is a combination of coercion and cooperation. The combination of sub-administrative power and privatized power enables the government to do with ease what it cannot constitutionally do on its own. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court 
and many circuit courts scarcely even recognize these new modes of power. They think of the Ministry of State and think, ah, oh, yes, that's sanitary. Notice and comment rulemaking. ALJs, well, as we know from Peggy and others, it's not as sanitary as they'd like to think, but at least it has the pretenses. Sub-administrative mechanisms don't usually rise, however, to final agency action. So it's difficult to get judicial review of the subterranean sort of power. And privatized control seems to avoid state action, so-called, altogether, uh, unless under Blum, Blum versus Uresky, a horrific case, you, has been, you can show that the government has coercively converted the private action in, into government action, an improbably high standard when you're suing the government. So it therefore will be very important for the Supreme Court to understand the reality of how we're governed now. Otherwise, we will be ruled without rules and without review. I think in these terms, by the way, in connection with Trollope's novel, The Way We Live Now, and I just like to call it The Way We're Governed Now, and it is frightening. Now, I've laid out some of these points, especially about self-administrative power, in an article published earlier this year called Courting Censorship, which explains how Supreme Court doctrine essentially invited the censorship to its weakness. Um, and it, part of the way it does that is by permitting sub-administrative power and privatization. But frankly, we need a whole literature and, new, and, 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 and an expanded civil rights movement against this sort of power, against this new wave of administrative power, which is sub-administrative and privatized. In any case, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to see you all here. <laughs>